Hi everyone. Welcome to uh, AI and Art. Take the train or be left behind. Uh, thank you for being here. I know it's been a long day. Um, and hopefully this will be a really interesting, exciting, and you know, perhaps controversial panel. Um, I, let me introduce myself, then I'll hand it over to the panelists um, who will introduce themselves as well. My name is Kayvon Ghaffari. I'm general counsel of Maker's Place. The, NF, the online NFT marketplace. Um, we are having an AI art hackathon downstairs with four artists, uh, Black.AI, Illustrata, DVK, um, and the Digital Koi. And through this hackathon, they're actually creating AI art from a poem written by Sasha Styles. So everyone, will receive, everyone has received the poem, and they have to interpret it, analyze it, and then create artwork through AI technology. Um, at, throughout the course of the conference. And then we'll also be working with Trevor Jones and Hackato to create mystery artifacts that these artists have to include in their ultimate artworks. Um, day one is done, Trevor Jones collaboration is done, and those will be minted very soon as limited editions. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to my panelists. Hi, uh, my name is Such. I'm the uh, founder of Emotionalism. Um, we are a company that uh, seeks to connect any form of dynamic art to the emotional reactions of a viewer uh, measured in real time and done at a neurochemical level and effectively trying to take what has been a one-way paradigm, which is the art speaks to the viewer, and make it into a two-way paradigm or a closed loop where art speaks to the viewer, the viewer's emotions in turn speaks back to the art. And huge fan of Sasha Styles. She's one of the people that we're talking to, working with. And I mean, that's, I look forward to seeing what your, what your hackathon comes out with. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Gabe Ramsey. I'm a, a lawyer. I'm a partner at a large international law firm called Kroll & Mooring. Um, deal a lot with intellectual property, Web3, AI kind of dominates que questions in my uh, work life day to day these days. Um, so I'm here, here to kind of lend a law and policy perspective to our conversation. I'm Richard Dalla. I'm an artist uh, from Germany that uses also AI, and I'm um, happy to be here. Hi, guys. I'm Zach. I'm very curious as a person. I love art, and I love business, and I've been lucky to explore Web3 and uh, intellectual property and all of these things. Cool. Well, you know, one thing that I have a list of questions that we'll be discussing, but you know, I'm, as moderator, I'm also very interested and welcoming of you guys asking questions. I think AI has taken the uh, world by storm, both within Web3 and without, and there are a lot of controversial opinions about the technology, about its power, and about whether or not AI tools are you know, original. Are they infringing other people's content? Um, and whether it is actually art. And so while I have a set of questions that I'll be asking the panelists, I do welcome you guys you know, raising your hands and asking your own questions. So I'm just going to start off. For each of you, do you think AI art is actually art? Who wants to start? Uh, me? Sure. OK. Uh, yeah, definitely it's art, because um, I gave instructions um, and, and the, like, like in my case, like I use a specific model um, that works based on my sketches that I made. So like um, it's pretty customized what I'm doing. I'm not just entering prompts and get like uh, full artworks. So that's kind of a USP that uh, that I'm using, or like that I think that's something pretty, um, yeah, that 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 I just use. So like um, yeah. So for, you, for me, it's art because so the, it's based on my art. I'm, I'm doing sketches and. So then, do you think there is a separation between versions of AI art? Because you just distinguished yourself as like creating the inputs, layering it on, as opposed to just putting prompts and then having an output. I think it's also art if you so like entering prompts is art for me as well because you have thoughts and the thoughts turn into art and without you, the this artworks uh, wouldn't be there. So, yeah. If you want to have it like that, it's art for me as well. So maybe it's like eyes in the beholder, right? Beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. How about you, Zach? I see it um, more as a tool as of right now. I mean, yes, we can give a prompt, but really and truly, it's a tool 
I also don't see the AI artwork. This is just my interpretation. I don't see the AI artwork as the final outcome. I just see it as a, a way of um, igniting ideas. So for example, as an artist, I need to be stimulated. I need to either check Pinterest or go for a walk in the park. Maybe I can uh, create something synthetic that can, for example, speed up this process. So I say, what if cat and dog come together? Do it as a prompt, see what it comes with, and then I add my two cents to that. So it could be a, a tool to speed up things. I see it more, more as a tool as of right now. Sacha, Gabe, do you have any opinions on this? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I, would agree, I would agree that it's a tool, right? I mean, without core creativity of an artist, you know, it's just an image. But, you know, my, my concern about it is, and it really it depends on how the artist uses that tool. My concern about it is it's such a powerful tool that I, I fear it's going to short circuit the creative process. And, you know, that, that's... But again, it really, you know, how do you, how do you mandate this? Or I don't think it's something you can govern. I think it's, a, it's an issue of self-government. But, you know, if, if and I'm going to purposely be, be, you know, argumentative or polemic, you know, if it's, if it's just about writing a bunch of prompts, right? I mean, I, I don't know. I like, I, and I'm not an artist. And, and I, you know, I, I, I like art. I buy it. You know, I... I I, I feel like maybe you, you know, there, there's, there's a part of creating a piece of work that involves a fundamental investment of time and intellectual and physical time, right? And, and I, I, I'm really concerned that AI is going to undermine that. And so from that perspective then, do you think art can only be art if someone puts like time and effort? No, so it's not, it's, I mean, it's not that binary. It's not like, you know, the outcome or the output is equal to you know the time and effort you put in, right? But I I, I do think there's there's got to be a there's got to be an element of soul in an art piece, and I think that that art that soul it's not fully derived from you know from the F, from the intellectual and physical effort, but I I do think an important part of it is. And uh, yeah, just like layer onto that thought, I think at some level one way to think about creativity is you know, maximal choice among many, many possible choices to express oneself. And the more options one has and the more granular options one has, I think those are raw inputs to creativity. And if you think about the creative process that way, um, it leads to interesting questions, I think, like, okay, I can, there's a you know, huge spectrum of AI models and a huge spectrum of inputs and the, the generation of the AI model in the first place could be where the creativity lies. And then the prompts, I can imagine a universe in which the prompts are uh, pretty structured, the model is pretty structured, and the outcomes are pretty well determined. So the, in, in that particular context, the creator, if you will, inputting the prompts, maybe not so creative. But I, at the same time, could look at the creator of the model and say, wow, you really invested some intellectual and creative la uh, labor into creating a, a paradigm that creates something. So it's, it's not all about the inputs. It's, to me, at some level, it's about the creation of the model. Uh, well, that leads to like, a follow-up that I want to start with Richard. Like, in terms of AI-generated art, who's the creator? You or the algorithm? Um, I thought a lot of times about the, the, that question. But um, so without me, there wouldn't be my artwork. So I'm the creator. So that's uh, kind of an uh, easy question. But, um, if you think like more complicated or more complex, you have an algorithm behind it, and yeah. Um, but but in my opinion, it's like without me, there wouldn't be that artwork. So like, Zach, you had a look on your face. I I have a look on my face because I've pondered about this, and I was saying, okay, the law states that intellectual property and copyright is automatic for human beings. So there's this question mark, like if you create something with AI. Does it classify as an AI created this copyright, or does it classify as me, the artist, creating this? So it's a big question that I still, I, I, to be honest, I've asked lawyers, and they don't know themselves. So it's, I'd love to hear your opinion. Sure, sure. From a law standpoint, at least in the US, I think um, 
it really goes back to the issue that I noted a moment ago. If you think of an AI model as a tool where many, many human choices can be, it's not predetermined at all. Um, I can imagine that its use uh, leads to something that it could be protected, for example, by copyright. But I think, I think that if it's, um, at least right now, the US copyright uh, you know, office doesn't take that view. Uh, I, I think it's right now a kind of very binary thing. It's like if, if the machine wholly generated the output without any additional human you know, create, creative effort, it's not enough, which doesn't quite make sense to me, I think. Um, but it, just another irony, I, I'll point out, and even make it even more complicated. Uh, I think this is true in Europe as well. Computer code, like the writing of a program, that code can be protected by copyright in and of itself. So a software program, you know, the actual uh, zeros and ones even uh, as a creation. So I think that argues in favor of protecting the mo even the AI model itself as a work of art. Um, I just, I mean, I think, you know, R Richie's a answer was telling because, you know, there's, there's degrees. I mean, from what you were explaining before, you start out with your own sketches. Yeah, right? yeah that's the thing. So, so that's the base input. So, I, and, and, I mean, those sketches themselves have an intrinsic creativity that is your expression. So, you know, I think that's a different ballgame. I, I mean, what I was talking about was more, you know, if, if the artist's inputs are purely a series of <clears throat> refined prompts, right? I, I don't know. I mean, I, like, again, like I said, I'm not an artist. I, I, I don't do this stuff in my spare time to even be able to relate to it. But, I, you know, I, I, it, it doesn't feel like a soulful process. And is it because, like, you enter keywords and the prompt and, like, you just don't really know what's going to come out of it? Like, what if you actually could anticipate based on your prompting? you know what the actual output would be. Is that a bit of like soul though? Because you kind of anticipate what your like vision is and then you're just manifesting it through this technology. Kind of like a camera, right? You look at a scene, you put the camera in your eye and you click, shoot. Yeah, I, so, you know, I think it all, again, it comes down to the, the process and I'll, I'll obviously clearly defer to the artists. You know, if it, if it, is, all, if it is artist driven, fully artist driven, right? Then yeah, then, then it's just a tool, right? But it's such a powerful tool that I can, I can certainly foresee slippage in terms of you know, the artist's, I don't know, emotional investment in the process. There's a lot of emotional, I think there can be a lot of emotional process, right? A lot of also just frustration. <laughs> It is a very powerful tool, one that we need to be mindful of and respectful of, right? Um, now, it leads me also to a series of questions concerning just the training models, right? These training models are voluminous, and they take content without regard of who created it, what rights are attached to it, and whether they even have the authority or authorization to be able to train on that content. Do we think that, you know, companies like Stable Diffusion, Midjourney, Dolly, and DeviantArt, they're like stealing art? by training it? And, how, and if, if, that, if the answer to that is yes, and how can we think that its output can be art? Is it just stolen art? So um, when you go through the, I don't know, what it's called, like the, the, the guidelines or like the, what it's called in English, it's like the, the, the terms, rules, terms of terms. use, uh, you can see that they can use your artworks all the time and blah, blah, blah. So, uh, uh, as a, but like, as what a, about the stuff that like they're training on, like Picassos or Warhols, right? Or photographers who have never used the platform before. Yeah, right? but I think that's a huge database. So, like, no one knows uh, except the the, the 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 data engineers or like the, the people behind Stability AI know who or with what data the 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 engine was like feed it uh, from the start on, and so like, um, it's pretty tough to answer that question. But I think. They know exactly what you're doing, um, and, and, and sometimes some people were like, they got contacted by by stable AI, and they said like, hey, can we use your your works as marketing um, um, tools or like like as, as marketing uh, stuff? Or like, can we repost your picture? So I think they are aware of it, and, and also trending artists. That's the thing. So like, 
they knew uh, what what uh, they, they exactly knew what what artworks are trending or like or like uh, like having a high high demand on the market. So like, but I think this is already an issue. I mean, I think you know I read that that Getty Images sued. You know, I think it was Stable Diffusion or Mid Journey, because because I don't know in in one of their images you could you could discern the the Getty water stored it yeah, like waterproofing. Water um, so I, I think it's I think it's already happening, and you know this is again again one. I, I was always under the impression that n there is no copyright infringement in any AI generated image, and then I read about this, which you know again I mean that that creates a whole other level of risk for an artist. And I guess you know a counterpoint to that is you know if I wanted to become like an impressionist painter. Right? I'm going to go to a library, I'm going to go to a museum and just look at a fuck ton of Monet's and Gauguin's and, and all them, right? And I'm going to become an expert in it. I'm going to read, 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 I'm going to iterate, I'm going to paint in those styles. In some ways, it's very similar to this training. I'm just training myself on this artwork and I'm inspired and influenced by it. And there's no doubt that some of my output will be similar to what I've been reviewing, right? That's the whole point of like becoming an expert in something, that you're doing more and more of iteration and like and, and gaining an expertise in something that's gonna be influenced by someone else or something else. So I guess fundamentally speaking, how is that like different? I, I, I mean, for me, right, again, I, I, I think what you will see in AI input, or in an AI, in AI, in some AI output, will be a like-for-like -like piece of, a, of, a, of you know, of some other external art. And that's, that's where I think the, that's where the, the danger zone is, right? Whereas what you're talking about, it's never gonna be a like-to-like -like piece. I mean, you may, you, you may look at 10,000, you know, impressionist artists, but at the end of the day, it's always gonna be your, your interpretation of that data set, right? Where, whereas that's not how AI works. I, at least I don't think so. Well, yeah, I mean, just to get technical for a moment, the trick, I agree with, with you that the, the, on the training side, use of a large volume or a small volume of creative works to train an AI model, in some form or another in general, what is actually happening is abstracting of ideas uh, to, that are going to be reflected to generate an output via the model. So it's not like, you know, it's not like uh, in training an AI model, there's actual it's just a, a copy that is fed, you know, rotely or grotesquely into, to, into the process. It's saying, okay, statistically, here's uh, this particular body of content has features of color, and I'm going to articulate those as a series of numbers. And this particular set of features is statistically more or less likely to be close to this set of features over here. And I'm going to express that as a series of numbers. It's descriptions of art. So in that way, to me, it's a lot like your impressionist you know, analog where it's like, okay, stylistically, I, I see some general patterns here, and I'm going to use that to create something new. I think what you're saying is that at the output side, what happens, even if uh, an AI model is trained by, you know, uh, 100,000, uh, 300,000 images, for example, and an output uh, generated, you know, generative piece of, of art is so similar to a single one of those inputs by maybe just even chance, that is nearly identical. What does that mean? You know, I think I think for the artist who created that particular input, and in the chances and statistics of what's going to come out of that system, it happened to be very very similar. It could be very painful. I think to be it would feel like oh my god, you've taken my creative effort. So that's the tr that's the trouble. I think I, I agree completely with that. And even in a sense, it I question because really and truly. Should it, isn't it, shouldn't it come from the platform, their own etiquette, that they actually make sure that the images that they're storing in the database, I'll, I'll just give you an example. So Photoshop just rolled out this new feature that you can use content, fill, and generate using AI. But they have stock. So they actually use their own stock. So people are paying for that service. So it could be that they're using it as part of the, their, their plan. But with mid-journey and all these other things, it's, it's a big question mark. Now, I do understand there's fair use, if I'm not mistaken, but then it falls into like what jurisdiction of what, of what the platform has or where you're at, because then it's a big, an even bigger question mark. Yeah, I mean, I think the global nature is pretty interesting, right? Because in the United Kingdom, 
AI outputs can be copyrighted without question, whereas in the US it can't be. So part of me is like, you know, I'm a lawyer. I'm like, should we just all like move to England, you know, create your AI art, then move back to wherever you live and have, you know, protection under well, the Berne Treaty, right? Yeah. Like, and you can have global protection because it was protected where, in the location in which you created it. Yeah, and the crazy thing is, like, it's one area of law that's relatively uniform globally. There's all these copyright treaties that existed for 100 plus years. You know, so there's a certain amount of deference cross borders, even if the law is different, that needs to be given. So that's, that's not a theoretical uh, approach, a actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, all right, we're moving true? to London. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so in the UK, all AI output is co uh, copyright eligible, whereas in the US, it is more of a discerning like, analysis where, and this is actually being currently litigated with the US Copyright Office. There's a uh, an artist, oh, I forget their name. They are uh, an author. They created a book called Zarya of the Dead. And it was a comic book that was both the, like, con like the, the, the writing and the art was created by ChatGPT and Dolly. And they submitted it, the copy, the, the book, the comic for copyright protection. The US Copyright Office initially provided copyright eligibility. And then they backtracked. And the US Copyright Office actually removed all copyrightability of it. And this artist challenged them and is starting to like push back at the Copyright Office and pick away at what the Copyright Office did. And the Copyright Office is starting to give protection. Now, the first level of protection was the like structure, sequence, and organization of the comic. Like this particular image on this page is before this particular image on that page, right? So that sequence of art was eligible for copyright protection, even though that sequence was by itself created by AI. And so the Copyright Office has really confused itself in what it's doing, but in the UK, all of it would have been protected. I don't see why. They don't kind of think of how to grow the pie in the sense that they involve more the creative community and they give out royalties. So if their artwork is used, a percentage would be given. So if, if people are paying for this plan, it only, it's only fair that people, the artists get paid as well for their images being used. Whether it's a portion, 50%, 30%, 20%. But then how do you know which art's actually being used for that particular art? So I'm, I'm not an AI expert yeah. and coder, so I don't know. But I'm pretty sure there is a way of how they randomly choose the images. They're all tied to a database at the end of the day. That's fair. I think there's a way, huh? Maker's Place is doing some stuff. You know, we're having some fun with it. We're testing some things, testing some bounds. We're trying to put soul in AI art. Um, that's what this hackathon's about. But, you know, thinking about these contours of both the legal issues, the kind of like moral issues of should we pay the artist? Does it have a soul? One comment that people have been talking about with AI art is whether it's racist. Because whether, whether it's, it's racist, like whether AI technology is racist because the people who are creating it may not be diverse. And so the content in which these training models are like training on are based on like who the developers are, right? And many of these developers are like, you know, white men. So there's there is a constant worry that like there's no diversity in the algorithms and therefore the outputs are not actually reflective of society at large. And I mean to add to that, right, there is also a a bias in I mean, most of these models, from what I understand, have been trained on, or they, you know, they've they've scraped the internet. Most of that content is English, so there's going to be an intrinsic, let's say, Anglo-Saxon bias to that. So I, I mean, that's it's not just programmers that are programming it; it's actually the content data. as well. Yeah. yeah. So like, where do we think about that in like terms of this question of like, is AI art art, and should we like maintain it? Should we keep it? Should we take the train or leave it behind? Like. There's a lot of these like levels of questions that I have, but uh... I mean, I, you know, the genie's out of the bottle. I don't, I don't think you can put it back in the bottle, but uh, you know, I, I, it's an interesting question, right? I, I, for me, if there is any, I, again, I, I'm just saying this from a Joe Schmo buyer perspective. I would be, I mean, for me, I, I buy art purely based on a a visceral reaction to it. That, like I don't, I don't care about who, you know, who it's by. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not buying to collect. I'm buying to appreciate. And I don't know. I honestly, 
I, if we I need I, more of you in this space. Sorry? We need more of that in this space. <laughs> I, I, so for me, I would, I, you know, I, I, and I, again, I've, I, like, I would probe a lot more, you know, to understand what, what the artist is trying to say and how they try to say it. You know, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, again, maybe because of some of the comments I've made, I, I'm coming to AI-based AI art with a deeper intrinsic level of skepticism than I would have with any other medium of art. That actually leads to an interesting question. Should marketplaces like Makerspace, you know, Foundation, Super, should we, like, explicitly differentiate AI art versus non-AI art on our platforms? Um, like, what I know from my collectors, um, they want to be, like, uh, aware of if it's made by AI or, or like, if it's, if it's made, like, differently. So, like, I did some generative drops as well, and um, they're pretty aware of that, and they want to be informed of that. So I think that's a pretty good thing to to uh, um, inform the collectors or, like, the potential collectors if that piece is, like, solely made with AI or it's, like, an, like a an, like an real artistical made uh, artwork, like, from scratch on, so. It should definitely be mentioned because, really and truly, it's a different story then. I even imagine it to an extent that, either way, AI is here to stay, and people are going to create art with AI. There can still be that parallel well, where both exist at the same time. I'm not imagining that AI is going to take over and there are not going to be any artists left. But it's, it's the story, you know what I mean? Ah, like, I bought this artwork. It's made by a human. No way. Like, you know what I mean? So there needs to but, be. But do you think that's because we've been programmed our entire lives to believe art is just made by humans in like a studio with paint? It's, it's a, it's, it's this a is a debate, by the way. It's, it's <laughs> a difficult question, because at the end of the day, art is something that is created to express yourself. It's true. But then it can mean nothing. But then it can mean a lot to someone else. It's all about who sees the art and how the art speaks to them. Like, if we think about art, where does the value come from? It's either the story. It's either, like, traditionally, traditional art was, uh, it was appreciated by the time, the skill. Like, oh, this took thousands of hours. Oh, this is made out of gold. But people tend to value story. There was a study I had seen. It's quite interesting. This person literally bought stuff from eBay. He resold it just by adding a story. And he increased the value by so much. Stories sell. We're, we're social creatures. But uh, it, it's an interesting point. I mean, on one hand, yes, I would like to know if, it's, if there's you know, AI that's being used in, in there, right? But you know, on, the other, on the other, the counterpoint is, Art is a visceral purchase for me, so I don't give a shit. I mean, I shouldn't actually give a shit whether AI is used or not. If the thing speaks to me, it speaks to me. And, and you know, there's also some interesting, I don't know, data points. Like, you look like a Damien Hirst. I mean, the guy just, you know, the guy's got a factory. He cranks shit out, right? I mean, you know, like, so, you know, there's, there's, uh, I don't know, this is a, that's a real life example that contradicts everything I've said about AI. <laughs> Just, I mean, this kind of touches on a couple of different points. Uh, w one thing I think will be interesting and, and kind of inform both your you know, sort of, okay, div you know, di diverse viewpoints in the, the creation of models is if we get to a point where the actual generation and creation of the models themselves is is more available to more people. Right now, it's relatively high cost to be one who trains a model and creates a model. Like, that's not something that everybody does. That's only a limited set of devel developers probably on the planet who can, can really do that effectively. Um, it's relatively low cost to use it and generate it, which is leading to a lot of these questions. Is that actually creative or not? But I can imagine a point at some future state, probably not too far away, where you know, any individual creator at relatively low cost and without being the most sophisticated developer, we'll get to a point where there's tool sets, more modular tools, to actually train your own models. And then, now, back to my point about choice, now it starts to feel like there's tons of choice, tons of storytelling, in your words, 
in those choices that are made right up front about how I'm going to train the model in the first place. It sounds like you do this, actually. Um, so you're one of the few, I think, or relative few. But it feels, I, I'm sure it feels to you like a creative process, making choices about exactly what inputs I'm choosing, exactly how they're going to be interpreted. That's a very creative, to me it seems like a very creative effort that's not just a, a prompt, right? Like that's, that's very much how you hold the brush stroke and, and how lightly you touch the canvas, you know? Um, and I think the, the, that point will come, it's like this is just, it truly is just another paintbrush. But that might be a, a little ways away. I mean, did you guys hear about the story uh, about this Sony f photography competition? So Sony has some prominent photography competition. There was a photographer that submitted totally AI. Uh, and, like won it, right? Oh, yeah, like, he won. Just, like, this festival. Right. And and yeah, and and so he su his submission I, again. I think he was poking fun at this, right? His submission was a completely AI generated photo, and he ended up winning the competition. Right? And he's like, no, you guys, you don't understand. This is AI. I, no, I'm not deserving of it. Right? And, and they were like, no, no, we're, we're still going to give it to you. Did, did he do it as a test to kind of yeah. see what the reaction is going to be? No, and, so he, I mean, yeah. he submitted the photo as a, as, mm -hmm. as a test. Right? He won it. Sony said, no, we're still going to give it to you. And, the guy, and then you know, the, part of the prize was they fly you down to the ceremony. Or I think it's in London. The, guy, the guy's like, no, 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 I'm not going to take any of that. I will pay my own trip down. And then he basically went, and his speech was like, I am totally not deserving of this. I, this is a complete spoof. And, and yet they were still insisting on giving him the prize. I mean, we think toilets are art. Think about that, right? Deschamps just said a toilet is art. Is it? I think he just did it to poke, right? Yeah. Um, but, but it just, I, I mean, I, I, I was saying that, coming back to your question, because I was thinking about it, is, I mean, like AI is is a is more powerful, you know, as an expressive tool than I think anything that has been, you know, in the in the palette up to I think now. That's probably right. And I think because of that, more people can enter the creative world, right? People who otherwise couldn't actually create for one reason or another. Perhaps they're handicapped. Perhaps they don't have limbs to be able to create. With AI, they can. It's a pretty like unique and powerful, special like opportunity. Now, you know, back to the question of should marketplaces distinguish, I guess if the answer is yes, at what level do we do that, right? Because if we think about some of these photos that use Photoshop, Photoshop is AI, yeah. right? So then should we think about like all photographs that are digital in nature be AI, and should we distinguish that on our platforms? Even more so with the new Photoshop generative AI like tool that just got it, like released two weeks ago. But even so, like, a digital camera is very different than a film camera. And a digital camera, if you're That's like, it. It's AI manipulated. So. Totally. It's making choices for you. It, it, totally. It, it, it. And so do we like distinguish that? Like, at what level then, if we have to distinguish and differentiate on marketplaces, do we go? And who decides? Is it me as maker's place? I will have a different opinion than you. You, you, and you as like, what is AI art? I, I, like I said, I mean, you know. I'm asking I, for a marketplace. Yeah, no, I, I, I would say, yeah, it's nice, but you can't police it, right? And I mean, we are, what, what's, the, what's, the, what's the measure, right? Twitter. <laughs> sure, absolutely, even, even more so with Elon taking over. Um, but but I, I, again, from a, from a buying perspective, like I, I will always try to understand what is the artist's story. Right? What's her background? What like I, this? Just I'm I'm just gen, I'm interested in that, and that's so. I, I would say if if that's how most uh, that's how other buyers buy, then no, you don't have to worry about it because you know you talk to an artist or you interact with an artist enough, you'll get a sense of you know. Well, I I don't know actually. I I think you but I think you may get a sense of their creative process. Yeah, and it's at some level the answer is the. The moral force, you know, you know uh, of, of art doesn't care about what the tools or the inputs were. The law may care. The law may say, okay, I'm not going to guarantee compensation to the artist. But if the consumer of the art loves the creative output and is willing to commit to it, pay for it, whatever, however, whatever the measure, then who cares? <laughs> you know, and those are different things <laughs> entirely. 
Right, exactly. Who, I'm sure I own generative AI that I've paid for. The, the, mach the machine made most of the decisions, and I just don't care. That's, you don't care either, I think. <laughs> if you love it, you love it. So, Richard, would you yourself, like, in your mints, would you, like, explicitly state this was created by AI? Would you, so we're talking about like how marketplaces should distinguish AI art versus non-AI art. Now, do you think that the onus is on the platform that does it or on the artist? And like, do you say in your descriptions, this is you know, created in part by AI? And if not, why not? I think if the platform uh, is handling that job, they will, that, that's a tough job because at some, some points, uh, like some, like AI generated pieces look like uh, like like generative art pieces up to a point. You know, like the, the the different models are doing such a good job that even like coding like 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 OG generative art people are like getting lost in the art and say, no, that's made by code. It is made by code, but by a machine. And I think it's it's like a job like or like I don't know. It's, it's the way how to communicate everything like via Twitter or something. What are you doing exactly and, and how to market your stuff. And you as an artist should flag your, your works like as an, as an artificial made artwork or like with the help of AI or like solely AI made or like, like, like OG artwork or I don't know. But I think that's in the hand of the artist and not in, in, in the hands of the platform. So, you keep having these like smirks on your face. No, because I'm, I'm paying attention to everything you guys are saying. Does anyone have a question right now? K1. And uh, I've been open minded about AI. I pretty much used all the new tools. Everything that comes out, I, I'm an open minded person, I try to use it and I try to mind, be mindful about it. But um, my question is, um, I think for me as an artist's perspective, I look at art and I, I want to know the story behind it and I want to know how much effort that has been put to create an artwork. And with AI art, it's like, it's like a machine and, and I feel like in a way you cannot compare it to human uh, artist effort because, and in the same, um, I'm getting nervous a bit. <laughs> yeah, you're good, you're good. Yeah. Um, my point, um, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say, I actually wrote the question down so before I forget. Uh, when you say AI art is art uh, because it delivers my vision, then if AI fails to deliver your vision, then it is art. Is that art? Like if it fails to deliver your vision. And uh, I who, just want to point... Be, who would yeah. be the judge of that? Is that you or the consumer? But, I've, but as an artist, because when you say, uh, you know, art is a self-expression um, for artists, I think that what matters the most is not about the viewer that consumes. So if you're an artist and you are putting something out there, don't you... Don't you think you should believe in your, what you're trying to deliver to the world? I, I think we're going a bit too like philosophical and I think we, we, you just create art because you're passionate about it or you're curious about something. Uh, really and truly the meaning is up to you. R what, remind me your name? K1? Bro, K1, it's, it's fully up to you. I mean, I understand that you want to see, um, I understand that there isn't the effort involved and the time taken, but at the end of the day, if you look at traditional art and you look at graphic design, they're like polar opposites. Traditional art is appreciated for the heritage, the, the material, the skill, you know what I mean? And the story. But then you look at graphic design, what's graphic design appreciated for? Communication. It's there for brands, you know, to communicate. They have just as much effort, but it's just with the idea, not the skill. So really and truly, it's more about finding what you're curious about. Do you want to get a bit into the communication side? Do you want to tell a story? Because really and truly, you can create an artwork, 
and just invent a story, it might speak to you. It might prompt another idea for you. But just follow your curiosities. I mean, that's, that's the easiest way to go about it. And I think if I may add something, um, like leaving something open to the betrayer, like if you have an artwork, like so many people try uh, like like build up their own like like feeling about an artwork or something. I felt it because like in the beginning I was just like writing briefly what, what my attention was behind the artwork or like what my idea was. And people started like, oh, have you seen that? I felt that when I was looking at the artwork, you know, like stories build up like in the betrayer's head. And I think like writing philosophically about your artwork is, 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 is pretty important and can be important. But sometimes uh, leaving stories open for the betrayer is also a different thing because people, people are building up their own stories for your artwork and they're like, I've seen that. I feel that when I look at the artwork. So like, yeah. And, I mean, just to come back to your point, uh, you know, I, I don't think a good artist will put out a work if it's just a work in progress. Right? I mean, I, you know, I, I think th this, is, this is their manifestation. Like, you know, would you, would you, I mean, just take it to an extreme offline example. Would you, like, put out a half-drawn half drawing? No. I mean, not just because it would probably look crap, but just because it, you know, it, it's not a sincere, completed expression of what you're trying to express. And I, 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 I mean, I, I, again, I'm not an artist, but I, I would imagine that, you know, if you guys are using something and you don't feel it's finished, you're not gonna, you're not gonna put it out in the market. I, in a sense, I kind of don't fully agree with that, and I'll, and I'll explain. I'm gonna push back on that as well a little bit. I'm, I'm gonna just explain why. Today we live in a world where there's quality and quantity. We live in a very fast-paced world, okay? Today, you're, you're, as an artist, you are also expected to be a good marketer. You need to get your work out there. If you're gonna wait, as an artist, I've learned this the hard way, if you're gonna wait for the picture-perfect artwork to share it, you're gonna get really, really unsatisfied. Why? Because art is a chance to connect. You put it out there, it's like you're talking to a wall. I've realized over time, at least, even listening to people like Gary, Gary Vaynerchuk, I realize it's much better to share the process because why? People are interested in how you make things. And besides that, it's okay if it's not finished because over time, at least I learned that I am not my artwork. So if people don't like the artwork, it doesn't affect me. I am the creator. I create artwork on a daily basis. There are some that I don't like that people like. So sharing the work only encourages the person to get daily feedback. And then what happens? It's like a loop. You get a bit of appreciation. It goes a long way, you know? You say, ah, like, I feel like I'm doing good. I'm creating something out there. It's connecting with people. And I think it encourages me to do better the next day. Yeah, actually, you know what? I'm going to eat my words. Because, because I, you know, there's a, one artist actually did that. She shared a work in progress. And, and, and I told her, like, I actually like your work in progress more than I like your finished work. And so she's like, look, buy the finished work, and then I'll, I'll gift you the work in progress. And then, you know, it actually looks really cool as a diptych. But, like, yeah, so, I, you know. I mean, and if you think about, like, the quote-unquote traditional art world, right, sketches from artists are super important, right? A Picasso sketch, a Da Vinci sketch, those are super important for, like, learning the trajectory of that artist, right? And seeing the story, seeing the evolution of art. And in fact, like this, our, you know, the Maker's Place Hackathon is kind of honoring that because these artists, they got the prompt two days ago. Trevor Jones added a mystery element today, his Bitcoin angel. And we're minting their works in progress tonight as sketches, as like historical, like on-chain snapshots into how this person is like evolving their artwork because we had the Sasha Styles poem which is the base of their like interpretation the base of their artwork and then Trevor Jones said hey you have to add a Bitcoin angel in your work somehow taking that snapshot minting and then tomorrow morning Hakatao is going to add more elements and so we're snapshotting like how these artists are creating and, and responding to these new elements and surprise elements but are these, is each snapshot a mintable, sellable piece? Yeah, we're minting them right now. We're minting the four artists with Trevor Jones as collaborators. 
for 169 bucks, you can get a Trevor Jones NFC tonight for 169 dollars. I mean, wow. It's pretty cool. And so, and then tomorrow you'll have minted pieces with Trevor Jones, Hakatai, and the artists as collaborators, and we'll see how different those two are, right? Just based on Hakatai adding a new element. And so, having this sketch is telling a story and enabling us as consumers, as viewers, to understand how these artists are processing these new inputs. If we think about them as just inputs, right? Hakatai's new elements, Trevor Jones's inputs, they're going to have to create an output. And we're going to be able to compare that, right? And it'll be on chain as an, as an ode to that process, to that like, ability to um, create a story. So I love sketches. Can you tell that I'm not an artist, though? I grew up with art. My mom's an artist. My dad's an architect. So I had like blueprints around the house 24-7. And so, like, yeah, seeing like my dad's like architectural designs over time was just really cool. Like what he, I knew, like, there's a museum in the Bay Area that he designed, and seeing what it first looked like, like his first thoughts of it compared to what the actual like end product was, is wild, right? And in some instances, I like the sketch better than the output, the final. But seeing that trajectory, that arc, has been really fascinating to me. But I, 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 again, I, you know, I mean, now Picasso is so hot that his paintings will sell, his sketches will sell, everything will sell, right? But, but traditionally, were sketches ever sold? I, I don't, I don't I mean, know. But sketches are definitely important from like a historic, academic perspective. No, they are. They are. But I'm, I'm at, you know, I, I don't know. I'm just talking. But I, you know, what, what's interesting is that you know. For a long time, I was wondering whether digital art artists were like minting too many artworks, right? As a response to Twitter, a response to like constant consumer demands, and I was like, you know, is that is there too much content out there? And then I like looked at like Picasso's like repertoire. He had thirteen thousand paintings and a hundred thousand sketches. I'm like, okay, never mind. Go back to minting. Because like people do it, right? Like that's a lot of art from Picasso. I th I was actually quite surprised knowing that. Um, but it must have sold. Why else would he continue doing it? It does kind of like, but there is a kind of like lower cost of entry to be a creator in 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 some ways that I think could lead to a couple of different conclusions. One is kind of your reaction. It, it, it's too cheap and easy to be a creator. You know, which, but at the same time, that seems like something that should be facilitated. That sounds profane for me to say that it's cheap and easy to be a creator. Um, we should all be creators. But it does. But it kind of leads to the question then: is like, all right, well, in in in, you know, if it if you're right that there really truly is this huge, ma massive volume and diffusion of, of content, NFTs or otherwise, who who's the moderator of taste, right? So historically, you know, we've kind of had systems and institutions that are intermediaries to, uh, to have those conversations, for good or bad. I'm not, I'm not saying it's a good thing. It's just something that exists. It's a lot more chaotic environment now. And maybe you're right. Maybe it's just the, you know, there is a market. Uh, there is some demand, and, and it will do its thing. But I, want, I, like, I don't discern that there are any such institutions, maybe events like this where we come together and we talk about it. But there's not much of that in the environment, you know? Um, I don't know. Thoughts? <laughs> Do you mint your sketches? Pardon? Do you mint your sketches? Um, I minted some of them. Like, yeah. And people were pretty interested in them because, like, the, 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 there were, like, my first, like, 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 fundaments where my art is built on without AI. And people so got the, the, the pure view of my art, and uh, they loved it. So like I sold, I sold some of them. And yeah, I love them. Right. That's pure. That's like a foundation. Everything is like built on, on sketches, like every artwork, almost everyone, right. like every, every artwork. So um, I'm with you that they're pretty important. Are there any other questions from the audience before we move on to other questions? Guys, I, can I see a show of hands? Who is in favor of AI? And who is against AI? Okay. Actually, I have a question, because I see a photographer in the, uh, in the, in the audience, Jose Ramos. He has a photograph on the wall back there. Do you think Photoshop is AI?
Hi there. I wasn't expecting this sudden question. You are almost throwing me under the bus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I would say that Photoshop nowadays involves AI techniques. We just don't realize them. When you use some automatic plugins for editing, they have some form of implementation of AI where they interpret the image and they make their own decisions based on algorithms, probably based on huge databases of images. So, yeah, even though I say I'm not an AI artist, probably when I edited that image, probably there was some AI algorithms in the background. When I try to adjust textures, tonal balance, uh, using layers, everything else, probably there's some AI behind it, especially with plugins. I don't use them that often, but they are more and more well known and used by a lot of photographers. So I possibly might be using AI. It, it's, it's really interesting. I think it goes back to what Gabe was saying, that it depends on the, the, the ratio of who's doing the most work. Because of right now, we use something like Midjourney. We don't, I mean, we can prompt it, but we, we, don't, we cannot imagine and predict that it's going to have the same outcome. Whereas a software like Illustrator, Photoshop, it, yes, it's using AI to a certain extent, but we are the ones who are making the right decisions. We know exactly if we click this, this is going to happen. Whereas Midjourney, something, maybe over time it becomes more refined. Who knows? It's interesting. So I was watching the four AI artists like, you know, create today. And I was like interacting with them, watching them on screens, and watching their prompts. And I spoke with one of them who was here earlier. Yes. Thank you. For the next generation who was born with the AI, do you think they will consider AI as a new trend artistic movement or just a technology will help to create more? If I had to give my honest opinion, I think AI is going to make some jobs redundant, but it's going to create more jobs. Because if this becomes mass, adopt, mass adopted, there might be the need for people who are, I, I don't know what to call them, prompters. Maybe you're really good at art articulating your ideas. And you can create the right prompts. So I do think that there will be a loss of jobs, but there will be also creation of new jobs. What, what do you guys think? Oh, I agree with that. I think part of it is there's the skill set of, of understanding how the models operate. And somewhat related to my point a while ago, you know, even short of you know, the technical creative, creative skills to build your own model to express your vision. Um, there will be much, much more nuance and granularity, as you're saying, like prompt engineering, right? It's, a, it's already a thing. I mean, that will become more fine-grained. Even when you think about it, it's like a communication. It's, it's like we're communicating with the AI to try to get what, we, what we're after. However, there is a bit of a hurdle, at least, that I've noticed. When you communicate with Midjourney, it's not exactly the best at um, building off the previous prompt that you've made. I mean, you can use a seed, but it's very hard to build off what you made. So it, right now, it makes sense to take it onto something else, like Photoshop, and cross-collaborate with different platforms. I mean, to, to come back to your core question, I, I think it's still too early you know, for, for defining AI as a genre or AI as a tool. Um, like I, I think we have to see how the we have to see how the market evolves. We have to see what resonates with people and what doesn't. I mean, you know, it it took generative art. Well, you can trace generative art's history back 40 years, right? But I would say in its digital, purely digital form, it's probably taken three, four years for it to really emerge as probably a genre. And and I think you'll. So I think it's it's way too early to say. I mean, people have just started playing around with this stuff. You know, I, I think I agree with that, but I also think it'll be both. I think it'll just be like the camera, right? Like it's a subgenre of art, um, but it's also a tool by which people like express themselves, right? Uh, the, the, I just want to point out the difference between Midjourney and, and Photoshop. I think it's a bit unfair to compare the two, because uh, I think Photoshop intends to help you within the process of getting where where you want. Uh, as of mid-journey, you just add a prompt and it gives you the output right away. 
Um, and I'm all for AI tools that help you to expedite your process of getting where you want, but not actually doing the job for you. And this is where the big argument comes, um, is AI tools like Midjourney are meant to help you to create artists or to replace artists. Because I think it's meant to replace artists. Like the only people who probably will take advantage of this are the people who are good at creating prompts. And creating prompts, I don't think it's a very, um, it's a very essential skill. Like it's not, it's easy to learn how to create prompts. You can literally copy prompts from different places. Just you, you can grasp the understanding of creating a prompt within like an hour or two. So. I don't know, what do you guys think of that, that? That kind of relates to what I was trying to say, and I, I have a question for you um, actually back. Does it matter if I, uh, two, situa it's two situations using mid-journey. Uh, yeah. I, I have hat one on. I, I have no understanding how mid-journey's model works. None at all. I just type in words. Scenario two, different hat on. Now I understand with great detail exactly how that model was created many, many nuances about it, how it's going to manipulate and understand the words that I input. Uh, and, and I actually have control, mm -hmm. real control, in the very minutia when I'm using those text prompts. In theory, I can see the difference between those. The second one, I have all this insight and knowledge and I'm making very creative decisions because I understand how the tool operates. In the first instance, I have no idea at all. Um, I can distinguish those in my head. But, but it's a little confusing because if the output is the same or, or very similar, it doesn't change the output that much because the model is just going to do what it's going to do with, regardless of my creative choice, then who cares, right? Yeah. Any reaction? Does it, would it matter to you? Uh, would, would it matter to me as what? Like uh, if, if, if um, you, you're using Midjourney and you have a very, very detailed, nuanced understanding of how, how, how it actually operates. So you have control, real control over it. What yeah, the output is um, going to be. Uh, yeah, that's a really good, good question and uh, in interesting point of view. But when I look at it, it's never 100% in your control. Because the thing is, like, you can write anything you want. It will always give you kind of different, even like you, you, uh, you try again and again, it will always give you a bit of different result. So it's never 100% on your control. Yeah. And I think as yeah. artists, we get the joy from the process of getting where we want, like the right. actual journey of like starting from one point and to get to the final point. And that journey is what we live for. Right. And the machine takes that away, you know, like just that enjoyment of where figure <laughs> should be in the, in the artwork, right? Like yeah. I want this figure to be there, but the machine does it the way they, they want. So like you don't have 100% control over it, even if you know every corner of the or uh, of the knowing how to create a prompt. So this do you think sense. that like lack of control though will always create a soulless output? Well, sorry again. So do you think that lack of complete control yeah. will always create a soulless output? I don't. I think soulless. Uh, I think it has soul at the moment. Like AI art, it has soul. Like you can see the soul. Uh, I don't think. That's a big argument, but I think the artist should represent that soul. If, if an AI creates that soul for you, then it's an AI art. And I don't think, that's why I, I, I'm not with the idea of like AI art being compared to human art, because AI art is made by machine, whether you like it or not. And it's not fair to uh, compare the two mainly because AI art is like, you can create a thousand artworks in one day right now, but an art, art, human art that could probably take few days to just generate one artwork. And right now, the algorithm, the, the social media rewards the people who are constantly putting out work. So the advantage is, is on AI art is huge. And the imagination is just wild imagination. So in every possible way, we cannot beat AI art as human artists. So I think this, this is an important uh, take on, yeah. You, you, you seem like you had a, a response to this custom. Hi guys, uh, because I want to kind of push back on your definition of what an, what an artist is because that's so subjective. So 
it's important to you to be able to control your output and like you have a, like a very specific vision and there might be collectors that emphasize that an artist does that but like artists are very different in what they want to achieve in my in my own work for instance i'm explorative so like i have no idea what i'm going to do i mean sure it, i have a visual language because i've repetitively repetitively done this some similar things in a long time so my expression looks like me but like when i sit down i i feel like i'm searching for something without like really and I'm working against what you are working towards. I'm working against, against self-judgment and, and against uh, the like, inevitable ba attempt of ba creating balance. I want it to be intuitive and like it's something that's working through me instead of like being like a designer that tries to fit it in a specific box and put it in a specific way, in a specific way or a specific view. But it's unavoidable that sometimes I can't fight it. I will. I mean, it's like a, with me, it's like a battle against it. But obviously, sometimes I can't help it. And I will have a judgment. And I will have a preference. And it ends up being exactly like I want it. But like, to a big degree, I want to free myself of that, to have an intuitive, explorative process. So even when I'm done with the piece, I'm like, oh, wow, that came from me. And that's very opposite your work, and but that doesn't make, in my own opinion, make you a lesser artist or me a lesser artist. But then your viewer or your uh, the buyer might just have very different preferences in what they look for. For instance, how much time is spent, right? And I think yeah. what's important is also that people are going to have to, you know, just like the non AI world, people have to distinguish their art through their own styles, right, through their own soul. And so, like, you know, the event that we're doing, all of them got a Sasha Styles poem. Mm -hmm. Then there's four different artists with four very unique styles, four different uses of AI, mm -hmm. creating four totally different like sets of art. And then you add the Trevor Jones work. How do their influence? How is that influencing them? Right? It's totally wild, like how different each of the four works have been mm -hmm. based on the Bitcoin angel. And then tomorrow with Hakatao's like mystery elements, it'd be really interesting to see like how their style is, even if there's like not a full control, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess one other follow-up question I have to that is, you know, as artists become more prominent in like the traditional world, they'll tend to have understudies who do a lot of their work for them. Mm -hmm. Is that still like the soul of the artist who is like taking credit for it? Like Damien Hirst has an entire like yeah. team of artists, right? And I, I wanna, I wanna uh, uh, kind of respond to what he said. Uh, I think he's referring to happy mistakes, right? Like in, in, when, in art, when we create uh, something, like sometimes we encounter happy mistakes. Like we do something by mistake, and it's like, oh, this is actually cool. Or like this, you know, you paint on a canvas, you're like, oh, I didn't meant to do that, but it did. And I think, I, like I have many of those happy mistakes. I'm not saying I'm 100% fully in control. But that enjoyment I get from doing that is completely like you it just it's hard to um, to say that AI machine uh, can make happy mistakes and just because it does something great like oh, okay you know that's that's what I like yeah it's like still a happy mistake made by a machine so like I feel like it's uh, it's a bit different like so my understanding of it at least so. Um, but yeah, I don't respect Damien Hirst for for doing that. <laughs> I don't. Well. Yeah. yeah, I think if you're an artist, you should you should do everything by yourself. Not m mainly like at least use the tool by yourself to to create your vision and bring your vision to life. So I think we have like 30 seconds left. Um, final, you know, final question: Is AI art here to stay? Oh yeah, I mean you can't put that genie back in the bottle. Yeah, I certainly hope so. Uh, I, as a collector uh, and, and lover of creative things, it's additive to my life. So that, that's my answer. Absolutely, take the train. <laughs> I mean, you can take the train and get left behind, or you can create a new way. I think both of them will live together simultaneously. This is the same discussion as print and digital. The exact same thing. So either you adapt, then you move forward, or else there's room for both. You can stay where you are. But I'd love to come and speak to you and see why, why it is that uh, you're not curious about it as yet.
The final comment. The final comment. They're kicking us out and you're making me speak. No, um, as a collector, I appreciate very much uh, various fields of, of art. And I started collecting many years ago. I do own some of Richard's pieces, and I'm very happy having them. I'm not planning to sell them ever. Um, for me, AI had been a discovery uh, last year. Um, I have some Claire Silver's work and, and a bunch of others. It was more an appreciation that it is the artist that's using the machine rather than using their own arms and hands and um, creating it with a tool which is not a paintbrush or a, a, a camera uh, for photographers. And until now, I'm still not 100% on the train, <laughs> sort of 50-50. I do know it's here to stay. We have a long way forward to grow. And we're just at the beginning to see where it's going to lead us. And I think the journey is very dangerous. Um, there are many caveats, and uh, we will see in the long run where it's going to lead. But last night, uh, Yvonne Tao, who uh, you probably all know is a very uh, good and <laughs> generally very, very interesting artist, explained to me the difference, uh, rather made me change my mind slightly about AI. And she compared it to aquarel. A painter who is using aquarel does not know how the paint is going to end up on the paper because it depends on a tiny milligram of water of extra paint that you use on the brush and how it ends up on the, um, on the carton or on the paperboard. You don't have that with oils. You do not have that with charcoal. You don't have it with any other traditional materials that an artist would use. And if you compare an AI to uh, aquarel, it really changes your mind. It changed my mind. <laughs> so not 100% there. Love your work, Richard. And uh, very happy to consider lots of different other options. And on that Thank you. uplifting uh, comments, we're, they are going to kick us out. Thank you to the panelists. Really appreciate perspe your perspective. <laughs> to Kwan for your questions, for Custom Horror, for your perspectives. Thank you all.